O thou afflicted, tossed with tempests, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all the borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. May the Lord add the blessings to the reading of his word. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Or at least a couple said, Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, this morning we're going to continue on in our series here on the breastplate that the high priest wore. And we're going to talk about Manasseh. Manasseh. Uh, once again, we are in the third row. Uh, the third row of stones that was on the uh, breastplate of the high priest. There were actually four rows of three uh, stones, and we are now on the uh, third row, and we are on the middle stone, which is Manasseh. Manasseh. Um, it's also interesting to note uh, that every son in the third row, which is Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, they're the only ones that were named by their father. All the other rows were, they were named after mom. But on this third row, they are particularly named after their father. Jacob received a name change at Peniel uh, from our heavenly father. And his name was changed to Israel. If you remember that, uh, the context of that, he was wrestling with an angel. And he was wrestling with that angel and uh, uh, some say it's a, a Christophany, um, uh, a theophany. Uh, he wrestled until the, the day, uh, all through the night until the day broke. And he said, I'm not going to let you go except me. you bless me. And the angel touched the hollow of his thigh. And he said, from this day forth, you'll no longer be called Jacob, but you'll be called Israel. And Jacob responded, I have seen the face of God. I've seen the face of God. What, a, what an awesome uh, testimony, revelation to, to have uh, from wrestling. But in Genesis chapter 30 and verse 22, the Bible says, and God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. Now, as we've been going through this series here, you know, there's a, a pattern here, and, and I don't mean to be repetitious, but it, like I said this morning in Sunday school, in, in one sense, I, I want to be re repetitious because it helps you to retain things. But Leah's firstborn was Reuben, and, but the Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel. And um, finally, the day came when Rachel had her firstborn, and his name was Joseph. When Reuben, which was the firstborn of Leah, when, when he was born, the, if you recall, we, we studied extensively how that Reuben defiled his birthright. And that birthright then was moved on even though there were several other sons that came in after Reuben under Leah, but it was Joseph that was the firstborn of Rachel. And so Joseph uh, was the one that inherited the birthright. Everything went to him. It, it's just interesting that, you know, when we look at our, our standing uh, before God, before we ever give our life to him, in a lot of ways, we are, we are also like Reuben. We've all gone astray. You know, no man knows how to do good. No man knows how to do right. That's what, that's what the Bible tells us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And we, man likes to do his own thing and live his own life. And in a, in a sense, we have, we've lost anything that is valuable regarding eternal life. And so... When we, when we give our life to Christ, when we have that born-again experience, when, when we get to that place in our life, regardless of how old you might be, with some it was very, very young, with others it was uh, 
You know, I was 24. But at some point when we give our life to Jesus Christ, amen, we get a new, a new birthright from our Heavenly Father. Amen. Everything is new. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Matter of fact, we get a, a name engraved uh, in a white stone in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17 to the church at Pergamos. The Lord said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white snow, stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And so there is going to be a new name given to uh, you and I. And of course, we, when we studied Revelation some time ago, you know, the white stone was, was kind of like a ticket, you know, into the arena or into the stands, the Colosseum, where events were, you know, taking place and, you know, the, if a particular box office seat or something like that, you got a white stone with your name on it and you could use that and walk in and so on. That's, that's what, what they say. And it, it meant other things as, as well, uh, or ideas. But uh, the, the bottom line is that we do get a new name ourselves. Let, let's, let's look briefly uh, here this morning at the life of Joseph. And, and like we've always said, Joseph is just an incredible individual uh, when it comes to our patriarchs. He's incredible in the typology that he has uh, uh, with Jesus Christ. There's more scripture written about Joseph than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was just an exceptional person. Joseph was the only one out of the three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph is the only one that ruled over Egypt. The Bible says that, you know, and, I, and we won't turn there, but I'll give you the reference. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham went into Egypt, but it was a snare unto him. He wasn't supposed to go there. There was famine in the land, and he took his wife Sarah, and they went, they, they went down into Egypt. And, and uh, he said, hey, don't tell them, you know, you're a beautiful woman. Don't tell them that that you're my uh, wife because they might kill me. You're just my sister. And then, you know, things just really went south from there. Uh, but, but God told him not to go down in there, but he went down in there anyway. Uh, likewise, Isaac, he, he went into Egypt. Uh, God told him specifically in Genesis chapter 26, do not go down into Egypt. But he went down into Egypt anyway. And his wife also, he, he did the same thing as his dad did. And said, you're going to be my sister and, and not my wife. And uh, everything turned on him uh, the same as it did his father. It became a snare unto him. Jacob, you know, he wandered off uh, to the land of Mesopotamia, uh, which is modern-day Iraq. And he labored there for 20 years for his uncle Laban. Once again, he, he loved Rachel, but he was tricked in a marriage ceremony, and he got Leah instead. And then he had to work another seven years, and he got Rachel. And and uh, but 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 the bottom line is this: when Joseph went into Egypt, he ruled. <laughs> he ruled, Amen. He ruled over the famine that was going to come upon the land. The others, because of famine, got out of the will of God. But Joseph, because of the famine, he ruled uh, in the will of God, Amen. In Romans eight seventeen, if you recall. The, the Bible says that suffering and glory go hand in hand. And if, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also, uh, that we be also glorified together. So suffering and, and glory, they, they, they go hand in hand. All the suffering in Joseph's life came before his sons were born, and the glory of his inheritance was given when they were around 10 to 12 years old from his father, Jacob. Now, we're, we're talking about Manasseh. That's just kind of a, a introduction here this morning. But we're talking about Manasseh, the, the son of Joseph, one of the two sons of Joseph. And his stone is the, the agate. And as we read in Isaiah 54, 12, and I will make thy windows of agates. You know, the, the Bible teaches us, uh, especially in, in Ecclesiastes 12, 3, I didn't write it down, but there's the address, that wi the windows are, are, are what we consider the eyes of a house. 
you know, when, when the Bible speaks of in, in, in this setting in Ecclesiastes, when he talks about the windows, they're shaded, I believe is, is what it says, is talking about the eyes. As you get older, your, your eyes become dimmer. Not everybody. Uh, I believe Moses, the Bible says, his eyes never was dim all, all his life. But um, it, it speaks, windows speak of your ability to see. And so God not only makes us gates of carbuncle for going in and out, but he has placed windows so that you and I might see, might see. I'm not necessarily talking about the ability to see as we're seeing right here, but spiritual insight is what I'm talking about. Windows speak of vision, inspiration, and revelation from God. That's what windows speak of. In Genesis 41 and verse 51, the, the Bible tells us here that uh, Joseph said, Manasseh, I'll call my son Manasseh because God hath caused me to forget all the toil in my house. So Manasseh means to forget. It, it, it means to forget those things that are wrong in our lives or those things that, that you were deprived of as you were growing up or at some point in your life. Now, I've, I've said this before, and I want to be careful. You know, I wasn't raised in, in church, and so I, I, I guess I, would, I could say I was deprived in, in that regard. Do I hold it against my mom and dad? Absolutely not. Uh, but, but it's just the way we, we were raised. You know, I've, I've seen those, like most of you here have been raised in church, and there is a, a, a great difference as to somebody like me that got saved at 24 and you that have been raised in church all your life. But the word toil, it means misery. It means suffering. It means pain. It means labor. It means iniquity. And what Joseph is saying here is God will help you to forget it. You know, some people live off their past, allowing it to dog them. And, and, and I want to really be careful in, in, in this part of this message here. You know, God can deliver you from your old life, as we alluded to this morning in Sunday school, the old lifestyle, the old habits, because the Bible says old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The double blessings of the Lord, as, as we learned last week in, in the life of Joseph's other son, Ephraim, the, the double blessing of the Lord will help you to forget the bad things of your past. Uh, the, you know, I, I didn't live a, a good life at all uh, up until 24 years old, but in the past 40 years that I've been saved, uh, amen, the, the, the blessings of God, as Abby was alluding to this morning, the blessings of God have, have, have by far caused me to uh, forget a lot of the things prior to 24 years old. I, I'd say from eight years old up to, to, to 24. The Lord has caused me to forget a lot of those things because he's overwhelmed me with, with the blessings, amen, of, of, uh, that, that come with uh, being saved. The psalmist said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation, amen, and call upon his name. Uh, I don't have that address, Psalm 139, 23 and 24, I believe it might be. But um, so, so the blessings of the Lord will help us to forget our past. Uh, God says that he will forget our past, and he does. Now, th this is where it gets interesting. It, if God forgets our past, then why is it so difficult for you and I to forget our past? it's something that doesn't come very easy. Even if, you, as a, if you've been raised in church, like most of you here have, uh, you know, there comes a time in your life where you, you get, get a little out of control or something and you do things that are wrong, maybe even backslide, do whatever. But, but there, 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 there comes a time when you experience, you know, the, the, the forgiveness of God and, 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 and we know that God forgives, but we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. In uh, Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 17, the Bible says, Behold, for peace 
I have great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, this is a good one. Uh, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions from mine own sake. Blot out, that means to remove, to erase uh, thy transgressions for my, mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. God says, I'm not going to remember them anymore. I mean, that's, that's profound. In Psalm 103, 12, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as we removed our transgressions from us. You know, they, you, you can go up and, uh, and, you know, north is north and down is down, you know, but try to catch up with the, you know, try to run the going east and take it as far as you can until it meets the west. You know, it, it's almost impossible. You don't know, you know, you're constantly going in that direction, you know. And, uh, you know, even though you might find that you're coming around, but you're still going the direction that you started out in. And so they, it's, it's almost as if the east and west never, never meet up. But he says, as far as the east and west is, he said, I remember your sins no more. It's impossible for him to remember them. In Romans 8.1, it says, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If you're born again here this morning, amen, if you're doing your best to, to live the Christian life, walking in the light that, that God has given, you, you are not under condemnation. To feel condemned is to be, to be uh, uh, attacked by the devil. The way God works is if we do something wrong, he convicts us. He doesn't condemn us. He convicts us. And so there is a, a difference. You'd be surprised how many Christians don't understand the difference between condemnation and conviction. To the Christian, there is no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's, that, 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 that's good preaching right there. And then one of my favorites, if not my favorite, is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you see, that's the key, confession. When you make a mistake, even as a Christian, when you make a mistake, you just don't, ah, it was just a weakness. You know, I'll get over it. I won't do it again. You, you, you're, you're, you're treading on thin ice. But if you as a Christian, you, you mess up, and you'll know when you do. You'll know if you, you say something wrong or, 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 or do an activity that's, that's wrong or look at something that's wrong. You, you know what, what sin is. And, 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 and when you know that you've gone too far and that you've sinned, the Bible says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you uh, from all unrighteousness. And so you see, that's, that's the... The, the, the critical element in our, in our walk as Christians, when we do mess up, amen, we come down, we get, we, we, we get it to an altar or a, a place in our house or wherever it might be and say, God, forgive me for doing what I've done. Please forgive me. And the Bible says here that he will, and he will not bring it up again. Amen. That's the beauty and the uniqueness of the God that we serve. And he gives us his spirit to bear witness with our spirit continually that we are his, his child. Amen. There are uh, uh, those who try to bring their past uh, into their new life uh, with Christ. And, and once again, I, I want to be careful with this. Uh, you know, when you get saved, you know, and the Bible says old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We have to be so careful because when you do get saved, a lot of times people will try to bring their past along into their, their new life in Christ. When in reality, God does not want that. He doesn't want it. Let me give you an example. You know, before I got saved, I was a, I was a truck driver. You know, I ran from California to Indiana, Ohio. I hauled produce. I had a, a beautiful truck and pulled a reefer, et cetera, and all these things all lit up. You know, it was just, it was just, it was my God is, is, is what it was. But um, to be very open and honest with you, in that life that I lived, there were several times 
I mean, I could probably be safe to say many times in that vocation that it, it almost literally killed me. Be- because of, of everything that went with it. It, um, it, it. it was a terrible life that I lived. So when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I didn't run back to, to wanting to be a, a produce hauler. I, I, I didn't do that at all. Matter of fact, when I gave my life to Christ, the number one, now, now, now really get this and, and kind of do a litmus test with yourself. When I gave my life to Christ, the very first thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to do what he wanted me to do. I wanted to be what he wanted me to be. I, I learned quickly that God's, God has a will, and, and, and I wanted to be a part of that will. Uh, one of the most awesome uh, revelations or inspirations that ever came to me in my life as an infant Christian was, was you know, knowing that from Genesis uh, to the book of Revelation, to the first verse, to the last verse, you know, we, we see all throughout Holy Writ in 66 books, there's a line that is drawn, and that line is called the will of God. And what, 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 what became so revelatory to me was at some place in that thread or that line of the will of God from Genesis to Revelation, my name is there. I have a place in the will of God. And, and I'll never forget when, I don't know whether I was sleeping or you know getting ready to sleep and just meditating, but when that hit me in such a profound way, I just thought, you know, this is really awesome. And so to do the will of God has always been, uh, you know, in, in the forefront of my, of, of my thoughts and my, my desires as a, as a Christian. Amen. That's what I want to do. Does this mean that uh, truckers are bad? No, I, I don't mean that at all. And I don't believe that you, you would take it that way. But there are too many people who have tried to live their new life in Christ with their sinful, ungodly past, only to discover that it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Amen. It just simply doesn't work. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We should strive to have the mind of Christ and not to have the mind of our past. When we consider knowledge, a good portion of of your knowledge as a result of your past, your your memory, your your our, our unique design in in retaining the things that we go through is called our our memory. And and, and let me say this: all oh, the bad memories that that I have stored up in my mind in in my in my cranium, you know, there there's so many bad things that you know up until 24 years old that. That are, that are still there. I mean, they're, they're there. But one of the greatest blessings that we have as Christians is, he says, the renewing of your mind. Amen. The renewing of your mind. And, and, and I have cried myself to sleep. I have done so many things to, in, in my prior life. God, you said you would renew my mind. And, and that's what I want. You know, I'm a new creature in Christ. Please renew my mind. And do the memories go away? No, they, they don't, you know, they, they do get further and further and more distant, you know, from me as I get older and they, they no longer hurt as much when I, when I think about them. That's, some of you could probably attest to that. That's just, just kind of the way it is. They get less and less and less because he's given me new desires and he's given me a new direction for my life. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, this is profound. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 15 and 16. Now, he's talking about the patriarchs here, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's the faith chapter. And he says, And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But they didn't want to go back to their old country. 
He says, he goes on and he says, but now that he desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. You see, that's what it's all, all about. When the children of Israel, you, you, you remember very well when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, you know, it didn't take them long until they come up against their first major obstacle, it's the Red Sea. And they begin to, 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 to badger Moses and, and yell at him and, and, and cry and complain at him because Pharaoh and his armies were bringing up the rear and they said, ah, you brought us out here to, to die and, and, uh, and so on. What to God that we would have stayed in Egypt? At least there we had onions and we had leeks and we had things like this that we could, uh, we were at least, uh, you know, eating something while, while we were there. Amen. You see, their, their mind was in returning to the past. And oh, did a lot of them get destroyed in the wilderness for 40 years. At different places, you know, where they, they were thirstier, they didn't have food before God gave them quail, before God gave them manna, they would always think about the past. This is the way it was before we, we left Egypt. Is we, had a, we had some food. Even though we were slaves, we still had something to eat. Was it the best? No, but at least we had something to eat. Always look into the past. You know, that'll destroy a Christian when we can constantly, consistently look into our past. Now, I, I, I wrote this thought down as, as I was praying this morning, and I, I thought it was very profound, so I hurried up and I wrote it down before I stepped up here. The only thing that Satan has on you once you give your life to Christ is your past in trying to get you to go back to it. When you look at that in conjunction with what we've been teaching in Sunday school, the impe impeccability of Jesus Christ, if there's something there that Satan can draw from to get us to, to go the direction that he's going or to at least get us to stop, it's our past. It's our past. But Joseph said his name's Manasseh. Because God has caused me to forget my past. Forget it. Was it erased like we would define being blotted out? No. Forgetting it in the sense that I would forget mine. I'm just moving forward in the will of God. I want to know the will of God. I want to walk forward in that. That is newness of life. Having a desire to move forward in the plan and purpose of God. I don't want anything in my past. It, it was sending me to hell. Why would I want to go back there? As Hannah comes to the piano this morning, you have to desire something better. You have to. Look out the windows of the agates beyond the past and get a new revelation. Look at what's yet to come. In Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Paul put it this way as I close. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind. It's not relevant for my life anymore. Forgetting those things that are behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Just... I want to stay away from my past. There's some people, there's always exceptions to the rule. There are those that had a past and maybe it be in some specialty, some vocation in life that was very rewarding. 
and I'll say these are the exceptions to the rule, where they sincerely laid it before God. They laid it before God and said, God, I'll do something else. Or you can take what I've been doing and Lord, sanctify it. I'll, I'll give it all to you, Lord, so that now you can be glorified in the work that I'm doing. And there's people that make that. They make it happen because they've given that, that part of their life unreservedly over to the Lord. I, I use this illustration. You've all heard it, but I want to use it again. It's, it's very appropriate because we are knocking on the door of Valentine's Day. I remember when I, I was uh, seeing Debbie, we never went on a date. Just for a few months, we, we, were, we were meeting each other at church. I'd take Debbie to church. We went on one date, and that was to Pizza Hut with some, an older married couple. They were our chaperones. And I was 24 years old. And, uh, but now that's cool. But that's the only date we ever went on. I, to the best of my knowledge, we, we just went to church together. And she had such an impact on my life. One night I'm, 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 I'm kneeling at my bedside. And I, and I remember, just as if I'm there right now, and I said, oh God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Debbie to be my wife. And I was so excited. And the Lord spoke to me and said, no, you're not. Man, I, I struggled with that. I struggled with it. We, we've only known each other for three months or so. And, and I, realized I, was, I was wrestling. That was my Jacob moment, I guess. I was wrestling with God and... But I got to the point where I, I just said, okay, God, that's all right. I want to thank you for putting her in my life for the past three months because she's helped me a lot. Lord, she was doing more for you than I've ever done. She was a missionary in Ireland. And so, Lord, I just, I give her back to you, Father. I give Debbie to you. Let your will be accomplished in her life. And you know what? The Lord spoke to me and he said, now you can marry her. <laughs> you see? That's the way it works, you know. If we, if we come out of something that, that, that's from our past and if we can get to the point, now if it's vile, we need to just run from it and not ask God to be a part of it and let your little light shine. No, no, no. You don't want to go down that road. No, if it... it if it's something that can be productive for the kingdom of God, then yes. But you got to give it to him first and see if he'll let you do it. If he doesn't want you to do it, then he's got something better for you. That's the way it works. Hey Amen. I was the exception to the rule because I got Debbie. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, could we? Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. We thank you for the life of Joseph and we thank you, Lord, for the characteristics in his life and the meaningful expressions, Lord, that he lived with his life. It, it was a very difficult life for him, Lord, in being sold into Egypt and being falsely accused and going into prison and to the point where he, he almost became a cripple. But Lord, it never, it never hindered, not one I owe to his relationship with you. Lord, because in the end, he was the one that was ruling. He ruled over his problems. He saved his family. But Lord, of all the toil and all the affliction, Lord, that he experienced, Lord, he... He named his children accordingly, Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim to be doubly fruitful. And Manasseh, the Lord has helped me to forget the toil at my father's house. Lord, help us to have a desire to just want to break from our past. Lord, help us to understand that. If you're not in it, then we shouldn't desire it. We shouldn't desire it all. We should run from it. And, 
and walk, anticipate the new life, the new direction that you have for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.